Broadway's my beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's May and the nighttime sighs briefly, begins the weaving of mists into silken fabric of its dying, Broadway is still. Broadway waits for death of night, for the first cry of day. And twined with mist threads, the echoes of earlier whisperings. And light pools spilled from earlier neon, diminishing now, contracting into cores of darkness. Dance of litter where dreams were and promises were. And through it, erratic dance of a sodden man who stops, then leans for a while against the edge of night, walks on. And in his wake, ebb of nighttime. And at headquarters, walk a corridor. Your way to a room where you've been summoned by Detective Mugovan. Old thoroughfare to the interrogation room to see. Well, you'll see when you get here, Mugovan had said. Hi, you poor soul sat crying by a sycamore tree. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knees, sing willow, willow. Well, you can cut that out now, miss. The lieutenant is here, and the lieutenant has got your message. (laughs) Her soft tears fall from her, which soften the stones. Sing willow. You hear me, miss? You can end it now, any time. Drunk? In my time, Danny, I have been in the company of many lady drunks, but never What's she doing here? Why isn't she in the tank? She was there, Danny, a couple hours ago. Picked up off a village street about midnight. They booked her, searched her, did all their little things, and then sent her up to us. I call my false love, but what's... Lady, lady, Why did they send her up to us, Mugman? Over here on the table, Danny. This knife, it was found in her purse. There was blood on it, fresh blood, human blood. I let the boys in technical have their way with the knife, and that's the report they came up with. Who is she? No identification. Well, no, well, no. Like she is now? How she was when they picked her up. The wrinkled summer dress, the booze. One difference. The knife was in her purse. Miss... My uh, false love said then... You know what he said? (laughs) Give me, all oh, you whose arms are soft and slender. Look, Miss... Yeah, uh, Danny, you talk to her. Be gentle. Be, well, like you are. Maybe you and shall... And that against your heart so innocent and tender, a little love and some forgetfulness. Well, 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 And then started to sway and lose control. Oh, hey, I got her, Danny. Dawn all at once, and she was caught in its first light. Supported by Detective Mugovan, looking up at him silently with suddenly stricken eyes. When he took her away to jail, she leaned against him, head to his chest. At nine o'clock in the morning, after the small sleep, the day began again. With the juice of the orange and the coffee bean, proven best to enable you to face life. And when fortified with a glazed donut, enables you to face life bravely. Thus equipped, stride down headquarters corridor to your assigned cubicle. The man who's waiting for you offers you his hand, shakes yours once, gives it back to you with a slight underhand flip. I'm Harold Tracy, Mr. Clover. How do you do? I was told to see you because my wife is missing, and I was told you had a woman booked last night for some reason or another, and her description checks with that of my wife. What does your wife look like? Again? Again. About this tall, coloring fair, hair light brown. Joan has a very small beauty mark right here at the corner of her lips. She... Yeah, Danny. Sergeant, the woman that was booked this morning about four, the one without identity? Who had the knife? That's right. Get her up here in my office right away. Only be a second, Danny. She was brought upstairs here for breakfast. Mr. Tracy... No, wait a minute. What's that mean, who had the knife? Is your wife a drunk, Mr. Tracy? No. Now tell me what Sure. Here, take a look. What's this got to do with Joan? Your wife was incoherent from booze early this morning, Mr. Tracy. If she's your wife, we've got upstairs. How come you're so concerned about her this morning? Why weren't you concerned enough about her last night to keep her out of trouble? I don't have to listen to that kind of talk. You'll do if you don't know how to take care of your wife. You ever see this knife before? Let me see it. No. Drunk? Joan, no. No, it couldn't be. Look, you sure she's my wife? No, but the description you gave me... Wearing a black dress cut, uh... That's another thing I can't understand about Joan. Right in here, miss. Well, gentlemen, here she is. What got into you, Joan? I'm very sorry. I promise you I won't do it again. That's the very least I'd expect you to say. I'm ashamed of myself. I should hope so. I'll never embarrass you again, Hal. 
I've been bad. I can't understand you. I've been bad. And... Danny. Hal, I hate you so much. Danny, she's got the knife. This is Tracy. Don't worry, Mr. Glover. I do. Joan. I hate you with all my heart and soul. And I'm going to kill you. Put down that knife, Joan. Kill you, Hal. Because all the years... Give me that knife, Mrs. Tracy. Uh, what's happened to her? Let Dr. Sinsky, you know. <laughs> Joan, what's happened to you? You better go home now, Mr. Tracy. All right. Look up, Danny. Look up from your desk and get hit with it. <laughs> Marty. Aha. Uh -huh. Who else but Marty Udenfoint, to be exact? Hits you, huh? This tired face you remember, you huh? You look fine, Marty. Tanned. You drove an open-air cab, you would also be tanned in the face. However, what happened to your particular set of values concerning the female of the species, I can't guarantee. Were you a cabbie? What are you talking about, Marty? That dame. What dame? What dame, he says to me. The dame the paper say you picked up booze happy in the village last night. With beauty spot close to lip. With knife in the bag. What dame, he said. Oh, Mrs. Tracy, what about her? Last night around ten when she hailed me, I didn't know for Mrs. or Miss. All I know is a few remarks were passed, and suddenly I find myself nonchalant in the back seat of my cab, and my passenger is driving in the front. Ah, it was a pleasant change. Go on. Well, we do the park, we do the plaza, we do the East River. Then she hauls up in front of joint in the village, invites me in. I say, thanks loads, lady, but I already had my quota of fun for tonight. What club? The Crocodile Club on Bank Street. You've got to understand, Danny, up to where we parted company, my passenger was only flap-happy with the season. Uh, yeah, the... I understand. Thanks, Marty. See, see you around, Marty. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm looking for the manager of this club. Truly? Police. Just one couple here, mister. A boy, a girl. A boy and a girl in a corner table. And see how they hold hands? Nah, isn't You the that... manager? I'm Leslie Cobb, and I manage. And just what it is it that you need in the afternoon, you being a police officer and all? Well, some information. You? About a woman named Joan Tracy. She was here last night. Say that name again. Joan Tracy. About 5'4", about a 26-inch waist. And the little thing right here, the beauty mark. And suddenly emancipated. Call me Joan Tracy the Liberated. That one? <laughs> the lady on a tooth? What about her? I only had one drunk in here last night, and she swore to everybody her name was Joan, and she was free, free, free. Come what may, she said, which was a lie. Oh? She found a fellow... She found a fellow with a book of verses, and she had a jug of booze. <laughs> Whether there was bread or not, I wouldn't know. What are you talking about? She went off with a boy in jeans and plaid shirt who calls himself Robin Forrest this week. Has a room down the corner, that way, an attic. And there to laugh and sorrow and taste... Yeah. The... Thanks a lot. And out of the jaws of the Crocodile Club, and onto Village Street in Maytime, past shop of French pastries and French legends scrawled in pink icing on sun-yellowed wedding cakes, and make the quick, free translations, and walk on. And leaning against doorway, the sandaled girl in batik sari, head posed against the hand-painted sign that reads, Jewels, Custom Made, Second Landing, and walk on to Corner Rooming House, where a boy who this week calls himself Robin Forrest is to be captured in his attic lair, where he usually is if he's not on the wing somewhere else. Attic is the room boasting the skylight. And ascend old stairs, banister carved with old memories, and onto landing, down hallway. And a faulty catch releases... Door drifts slowly into opening. Mm -hmm. 
latticed rays of sun from fulcrum of skylight to hold in dust dance boy sprawled on floor boy in plaid shirt and jeans young man with knife wound young man dead young man murdered <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Thanks to careless people, forest fires have a long season. That season has begun again with the coming of warm weather. In the interest of preserving our natural resources, we are all asked to be especially careful when in or near our woodlands. Nine fires out of ten are man-made. Every fire makes a dent in our natural defenses. To keep our woodlands open and free for enjoyment, eliminate forest fires. The season of promise is dying, and on Broadway its swift, silent passing goes unnoticed. Spring into summer means only the shifting of mannequins in a store window, and draping them in less clothes, preserving only the precise curve of wrist. And still the serpents of light uncoil in identical pattern and leap skyward. And still the street is filled with sounds that were there yesterday, and the people, and the riot. But spring is dying, and summers are coming in. Hurry, only so many tomorrows for the dream to come true. And where I was, office at police headquarters late afternoon time, the hour of the police sergeant from Never Never Land, who had somehow gotten a job in New York. Danny. Come in, Gino. Well, how did you like it? How did I like what? How did I like what, he says. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I said, Danny. How did you like that book I give you? Book? I, the corpse. You know, the first adventure of the twanger. That two-fisted guitar strumming... Oh, well, I haven't read it yet. You see... Well, Danny, here's the sequel, so you can read both in one sitting. Thanks, Gino. Kiss me, Irving. What an adventure. In this one, the twanger cleans up Anne Arundel County in Maryland. Thanks a lot, Gino. Your jaw will drop. Gino. Mind it. Gino, you have anything for me? Report from Detective Dennison if your mood is such. It that... is. Believe me, it is. <clears throat> that Mrs. Tracy is lying in a hospital room under the care of Dr. Sinsky where she lies and stares at the ceiling and says not a word. Go on. Incidental information is all. If you please. A mother died last week. Oh? Fell down the steps in her apartment house. It was an accident then for sure? I think so. Says here on the report, if accidental death, checked here. It's checked. See? What else, Gino? Joan Tracy is a lady with a talent. She plays cello. In fact, there are three of them. What? In the trio. Two friends and Joan Tracy. If you want who the two people are, Danny, well, here. If I seem like a daisical, Danny, the twanger, my jaw dropped. Please. Please, go away. Mr. Codalier? It matters to you who I am? Yes, it does. I'm from the police. Thank you. I am Codalier. Now, please, go away. Police. On police business, Mr. Codalier. You wish I... to enter into negotiations with me concerning private piano lessons, concerning harmony, theory? Concerning Joan Tracy. Uh, theory. Joan. All right, if we talk inside? Please. Then Joan is your business with me, eh? Because the boy she was with last night was found murdered. A boy? Not her husband? Not her husband. I think I read of it. I'm not sure. Drunk, a knife, a death. So many in the newspapers. It becomes vague. It becomes so many Joan. Another thing we know about this Joan. She was a friend of yours. She played cello in a trio that you... And you wish my interpretation of Joan. What phrasings, what nuances, what dynamics would bring a woman like Joan to murder a boy, not her husband? All I want from you is... I will tell you of Joan. The theory, okay? All right, tell me. A cringer. A woman who put on the face of a beaten child when no one lifted a finger to her. You'll explain it to me, huh? So you will understand. In a trio, 
When a cello makes a boo-boo in phrasing, in breathing, in emotion, looks are exchanged between the violin and the piano. When such looks are exchanged between us, John sometimes wept, cringed, looked beaten. Well, I still don't understand. I will show you. On my piano. Uh, this is a passage for the cello from a trio we have often played. It is to be sung so, with heart, with subtlety, with delicacy, as I have played it. John played it so. Understand? I think so. Good. Now that is John. Strict tempo, strict pitch, and strictly without heart. That is John. What I said before to you. Please do it. Please, go away. I play the violin. There's Joan and her cello, Godali with his piano, and I play the violin. Well, I want to know about Joan, Mr. Vernon. Not very good with the cello. I've heard that. Uh, other things, though. I love her I... once. Oh? In retrospect, it was pity more than anything else. I was filled with a sorrow for her. Why? This was before she was married, of course. About the pity, Mr. Vernon, why? She was, is, docile because of her mother, very domineering mother. A cliché of a domineering mother, a do-this, do-that cliché of a domineering mom, and if you don't, I'll fall on my face with a heart attack and you'll be sorry, you know? And I pitied Joan. I see. One day I took her in my arms, and I liked it. It started off by feeling sorry. When I was holding her, I forgot my purpose in doing so. I said to myself, love. Tell me something, Mr. Vernon, about this trio. A simple thing. We all studied at the academy. We met. One evening long ago, we said, let's have a trio. We're none too expert, really. We saw and pound and call it Beethoven, and it's a fine time. And you were in love with Joan once, but not now, is that right? Right. You see, I recognized what kind of woman Joan was and what I really felt for her, and that she would need a man exactly like her mother. You know her husband? Just pokes his nose in, waves a riding crop at us, and vanishes. When's the last time you saw Joan? About, uh, let me see, four days ago, Tuesday. Tell me about it. To console her about her mother's death. Well, I understand her mother fell down the steps and died. Well? Well, what? You want me to say, isn't that nice? Oh, forget it. I just wanted you to comment on whether you thought... Her that... mother was pushed? How do I know? i got better things to do than conjecture on a horror like her. Okay. Uh, tell me about the last time you saw Joan. Joan was in the library at her home. I went to her. She was playing the cello, sawing away tunelessly and loud. She noticed I was there finally, grinned at me, picked up the cello and broke it over an antique brass pot. And don't ask me whether the latter's symbolic. And that's all? Not quite. She sobbed then. And I felt sorry for her again and took her in my arms again, and I thought suddenly what a stupid girl this was. I said goodbye to her. Anything else you can tell me about her, Mr. Vernon? Not a thing. She really isn't stupid, you know. My first impression was correct. To be pitied, that's more nearly correct. And back in the street now, at city at 9 o'clock of May... Time for Stoop Dweller to chart the course of new fallen star and also observe the nebulae in wake of the summer passage of a boy and girl through a million private comets. Time of the chuckle and the elbow poke in the ribs. Time to check condition of tenement roof and stake out the place of summer sleeping. Walk through currents of May night. And somewhere between where you were and headquarters, stop for the sandwich and the coffee with conjectures on the murder of a boy who had read poetry to a drunken woman woman who had tried to kill her husband in your presence, who the night before had driven a cab, had shouted in the Greenwich Village Club that she was free, 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 and leave them alongside the tip, because there were new conjectures to be had at headquarters, from study of reports, from further musings against May night, and in a while from Detective Mugovan also. About Joan Tracy's husband. Oh, what about him? Well, him, Joan Tracy's mother, different relationship, different age, different gender, but... Uh-huh, but... But what, my goodness? But peas from the same pod. Happens in a pod sometime. Now, the way I know is one summer my seed man uh, showed you me You mind charge. just about Tracy, her mother, her husband? Oh, damn. Mugovan, so help me. Oh, don't get riled, kid. 
Now, you've been doing legwork. I've been doing legwork. So just don't get riled, huh? <laughs> yeah, on your feet, Danny. Walk it. You haven't had enough of it, huh? Look, don't you understand? I've been trying to tell All right, you... Mugovan. Tell me what. What I found out from my legwork. From friends, neighbors, spectators on the life of Joan Tracy. Well? What I already told you. Her husband, she tried to kill in front of me. Her mother, who fell down steps and died a week ago. Both the same type people. Both wielders of the big stick, tongue lashers of what they considered lesser persons in the human scale. You'll explain it, huh, Mugovan? Glad to. Now, look. Mother of Joan Tracy, one of those mothers. The kid, Joan, the woman, Joan... Couldn't make a move, couldn't breathe, couldn't smile, couldn't cry until Mama gave the word. Up until Joan married Mr. Tracy, that is. Well, she married him, then what? Uh, a word about the background of husband Harold Tracy. Uh, it seems a few years back he was headmaster in a boys' military academy. Seems he had codes of behavior for little boys. Oh, and disciplines to match. <laughs> Pete Chirino of a chap with the willow rod, I understand. Now, Danny... You take a man like that, marry him to a woman like Joan, what have you got? Yeah. Get on the phone. Get him down here, Mugovan. Just uh, have a seat, Mr. Tracy. How's my wife? I understand you've been calling every hour. They said she wouldn't talk, that she was just staring. Once... What? Once when I was a headmaster, there was a boy who did that. I took him for a walk. I talked with him. I cured him. He didn't do it anymore. You ordered him to behave, is that right? I illuminated for him the difference between proper and improper conduct. Joan already knows that. Mm. Then now all you think your wife needs is talking to by you. Exactly. Why did she want to kill you, Mr. Tracy? You mean this morning with a knife? Of course, that's what I mean. Were there other times? Certainly not this morning. Joan was drunk. No, no, I don't think so. I know my wife. Do you know whether she ever tried to kill her mother? Oh, <laughs> are you serious? Then she didn't push her mother down the steps, did she? Joan was with me in Atlantic City when her mother fell. Well, that's what I wanted to know. You see... Stay in here, Mrs. Tracy. Hello, Joan. Hello, Hal. You see, Clover? You ready to go home, Joan? Whenever you say so. You see, Clover. Please uh, sit down, Mrs. Tracy. Go ahead, Joan. In a little while, dear, I'm going to take you home and we'll have a little talk. Hal. What, dear? If you ever get close to me, I'll try to kill you. She don't like you at all, Mr. Tracy. She's not drunk, either. What have you people done to her? Nothing. They haven't done a thing. They gave me time to just lie there in bed and scheme. They didn't bother me. I've got a lot of schemes. And if we go home together, one of them I like very much. Joan. Joan. Uh, no. Joan. Get away from her. She's my wife. You heard what he said. Get away from her. That's better. <laughs> Mrs. Tracy. Yes. What? You want to tell us about last night? Joan, you don't have to. I want to. Go on. I got very drunk. I met a boy who recited poetry. We got very drunk together. I passed out. I woke up. I think he was dead. I didn't know. I drank some more from the bottle and I walked out into the street. And then it was this morning and I was here. You didn't have to say that. Why not? Why not? What's happened to you, Joan? I'm free. What? You know. I don't understand what she's talking about. She's a very sick woman. My wife is sick. She'll get better. That about does it, huh, Mr. Tracy? What are you talking about? Your wife's mother died last week. And... I can tell it. I've been thinking about it. I know the words. When she died, I heard about it and I sat down to cry. I couldn't cry. I felt relieved. You said free. Free. And the kind of life you had with your mother. Afraid, docile. Hal. What? That's why I was such a good wife to you. Why the transition was so easy from daughter to bride. It was the same thing. You're the same kind of person. You could have explained it to me. No, not to you. You'd hit the air with your riding crop and demand obedience. Joan, listen to me. <laughs> Joan, listen to me. Joan, listen to when me. When your mother died, it happened. You were free of both of them. That's what I meant. What about it, Mr. Tracy? Well... 
Well, what? I had to show her, that's all. I caught up with her at that place, at that club in the village, as she was going out with that boy. I followed them. They were both in a stupor, a drunken stupor, when I walked in on them. So you stabbed the boy and planted the knife on your wife? It was sordid what you did, Joan. Ugly. Unbecoming. It needed to be stopped. I stopped it. You killed a boy, Hal. You didn't stop anything. I may go now. May I not? Goodbye, Hal. One thing you can be sure of, you'll never be embarrassed by me again. Wherever you are. Dawn touches Broadway now. The last shadows leave and take away the night. And over the river a cloud drifts, and a bird dips and touches it with a wing. The people wake. The fury gathers and funnels out into the streets. Walk easy. Another day has come. The shock has come. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My Beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calford as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mogovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Sammy Hill was heard as Joan and Whitfield Connor as Hal. Featured in the cast were D.J. Thompson, Jerry Hausner, and Harry Bartell. Bill Anders speaking. Monday night on CBS Radio Suspense, Dick Haynes stars in Pigeon in the Cage. It concerns a man who is trapped in an elevator between floors, but who dares not call for help because his only possible rescuers are murderers. With this story, CBS Radio hopes once again to keep you in suspense this Monday night on most of these same stations. Remember, the top dramatic show of all, the Lux Radio Theater, is heard Monday nights on the CBS Radio Network.